Olin, and salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. It's Sunday, the 12th of September, 2021, and I was just wondering, as I sometimes do, if you ever wonder what I do when I get up in the morning. Well, how about this morning? I got up and I sat in the kitchen and I made use of my cell phone, which I rarely do because I hate that device. But on some occasions, given the conditions that we live in today, it's convenient or even required. So sometimes in the morning, I sit there, luxuriating quietly in my innocence, and I exchange texts with Eric Clapton. Now, I don't know Clapton very well. I mean, hardly at all. I mean, we've never met. And I'm pretty sure he would deny knowing me or perhaps even believing in my existence. Nevertheless, we do exchange text due to a common interest in cars. So sometimes we text back and forth about what car we're going to use on that day. And so we did this morning. We always do it in a brief code with great brevity, of course. And so the first thing I get from Clapton is the specs on one of his Ferraris, and he has quite a few, as you may know. So the first text I get is SP12EC, question mark. Means he's considering taking that one out today. So I text back, because I'm considering going somewhere as well. And the choice of car is, of course, a serious matter for a gentleman of our caliber. So off the top of my head, I text back, Cayenne Porsche. That would be my pale gold Cayenne Porsche, question mark. Am I going to take the Cayenne Porsche out today? Well, that's something I do, to be honest, to impress the locals. And I'm not going that route today, so certainly not. Next text incoming from Clapton. The Enzo, question mark. Well, come on, Eric. I mean, where are you going? Le Mans? I mean, that's a bit off the charts. I can't believe he's seriously going to take the Enzo out in public. Anyway, brief pause. And I text back my Jag, question mark. Now, I take out my Teardrop Fender Classic Restored Jag on really special occasions. See, the color of that vehicle is a deep scarlet resembling menstrual blood. And also, it has an overcoating which gives the dark scarlet color a kind of menacing gleam. Well, I only take out the Jag when I'm going to give a talk on the secrets of Kala Tantra and sexual magic or some other notorious and transgressive subject like that. And that's not exactly what I'm doing today, but it's close. Okay, hold on. Next incoming text from Clapton. 64F 250GT Lusso. Ah, there's no question mark. He has decided to take that 12 valve, 532 horsepower beast out on the road today. What an elegant choice. And the color is silver gray. Well, it's time for me to make my choice. And so I text back. Bugatti, exclamation mark. 
Immediately comes the response from Clapton. Brilliant. You know that brilliant is like Brit speak for what we Americans mean when we say great. Well, that's obviously the end of our little exchange. We both decided on our vehicles for the day. And I get the text from Clapton's saying, as usual, signing off, toodaloo. And I respond, toodle you. And that's it. So some mornings I do that, and I did it this morning. Well, on the occasion of taking out my Bugatti to visit Lily. Yes, indeed. Now, I won't say anything much about Lily. She can reveal herself to you by her speech and her manner. But I will say that I don't include her in my special collection. I would never say such a thing. But she does say that she is in my special collection. So make of that what you will. So I get in my Bugatti, but it's much later in the day because my rendezvous with Lily is in the early evening, just before dark. So I drive through some mountain roads, winding this way and that, feeling the breeze go across my face. The pleasure of driving a Bugatti is like nothing else in the world. And I go up through some woods and into a sort of mountainous territory, and there, perched on a sort of mesa, is a big San Francisco-style house. A mansion, really, with big bay windows and three stories, looking quite mysterious. And, of course, expensive. In fact, it looks exactly like the Gothic mansion on the cover of one edition of The Hawk Line Monster by Richard Brodigan. The Hawk Line Monster, a Gothic Western. Quite a novel, that one. Anyway, that's no accident, as you shall soon learn. So I park under some almond trees, and I walk up the stairs, the wooden staircase. It's about 18 steps. I step onto the porch, approach the door, and there is a button, a doorbell, which is a pearl with the sigil of Lucifer inscribed on it. And I press the doorbell. There's a faint, lovely sound from inside. And then I count the beats. And after ten, the door opens. And there is Lily, stark naked, in the buff, in the raw. And she greets me with a mischievous turn of her lips. And from the last rays of the setting sun over my shoulder... I see an alluring gleam in her eyes. So I enter. We go through the main room and off to the left into the drawing room, her salon. Now, you will recall, you will recall, won't you, that I mentioned The Hawkline Monster, a novel by Richard Bartikin. Well, Lily happens to identify with the main character in that novel. And when she acquired this house, she had it redone so that the decor resembles the house in the novel. And the decor is of the late 1800s in the western United States, in Arizona or California. Lily intended that the mansion should resemble the home of, say, a rich and elegant rancher who was once a cowboy. So there are signs of the cowboy life everywhere, photographs of bronco riders on the wall, and there's a stack of guns in the corner, 
and there's a case with beautiful set of pistols in a holster designed with silver and pearl ornamentation. And these are some of the lovely artifacts in Lily's house, including, of course, the living artifact of beauty, which she is. She gestures for me to sit down on a plush chair, and she sits right across from me in a sumptuous love seat. It has a high back and elegant curving arms of hickory wood, and it's upholstered in a beautiful plum color. And there she sits, daintily, right in the middle of the love seat, sitting straight up like a proper girl, and with her knees about an inch apart. Well, you can guess what I'm thinking, looking at her knees, and I've often looked at her knees for long periods of time, off and on. I'm thinking, you could just drop a slice of bread in that space between her knees, as if you were dropping it into a toaster. And I'll bet if she pressed her knees together, she could toast that slice of bread. We sat in silence for a few minutes, as we always did, savoring the moment, savoring the ambience of the house and the ambience of the wood and the hillside and the setting sun outside. And then Lily said to me, so delighted to see you again. I have a couple of gifts for you this evening. And I said, I'll bet you do. Now upon that exchange, she quickly stood up and turned around, and put her knees on the love seat and leaned forward over the back of it, which was quite high. So her shoulders were on the other side of the love seat. Well, having nothing else to do while she was after whatever she was after back there, I looked closely at the soles of her feet and my gaze went upward and I looked at the bumps on her spine and I saw the way that her hair fell on either side of her head, down, across the back of the love seat. And as she was groping around back there, don't ask me what she was doing or what she had on her mind, she said over her shoulder, Yes, I have two gifts and you're looking at one of them. Can you tell me what it is? And in just a heartbeat, I said, a truffle. Lily said, come again, sir. And in two heartbeats, I said, a niche of jellied butterflies. Three beats, and there is Lily's reply. Come again, sir. And then I say, Lidol Pesh, resorting to French. I see that Lily gives a little shudder of pleasure to her shoulders, telling me that she likes my responses, all three of them. Now a few seconds pass, and suddenly Lily says, Gotcha! And I see her stand up on her knees and turn around to face me, but holding one arm behind her, behind the back of the love seat. So she sits down facing me as she originally did. And then narrowing her eyes and holding them steadily on my eyes, she brings her arm from around behind the sofa. And there, what do I see?
Well, from the ends of her fingers, which are elegant fingers, she plays the piano, beautiful hands. She often plays scrub and sonatas for me, usually at midnight. And from her fingers, along her wrist, and all the way up her forearm, to her elbow, and up her elbow, to her shoulder, there is an entwined serpent. So delicately and graciously entwined that its tail comes to rest just beneath her ear, which happens to be one of the many places of Lily that I enjoy. She holds her arm up to show me how the head of the snake is poised. It's resting its head right in the palm of her hand. And she says, now that is a dwarf python. And I say, I'll bet it is. And so we proceed to talk about this wondrous creature. Dwarf pythons are quite rare. And I happen to know from inspection and familiarity that this is a dwarf python of Namibia. Well, what a delight, my second gift for the evening. Lily is super pleased that I like it. And she brings her arm down, puts her hand in her lap, and the python uncoils very slowly. And then it recoils and reposes in her lap with its head resting on her right knee. And there it is, in her lap. Ooh, so cold, so smooth, Lily says. We are both deep devotees of the coldness of serpents. So some moments pass, and then it's as if we both had the same thought at the same moment. You know how that can happen when you're intimate with someone and when you both let yourselves surrender to the moment. So Lily and I were thinking exactly the same thing at that moment, and well, you can guess what it was concerning snakes. We were thinking that there was actually one occasion when an intruder penetrated a Gnostic mystery cell and accurately reported on what he saw. That did happen once, and there is proof of it. And we were thinking of the proof and smiling together about it. So then Lily said to me, let's make the memory together. And at that moment on that cue, I looked into her eyes, she looked into mine, and we locked into something like a mutual trance. We've done this before on various occasions, and over time we developed a little ritual we would enter the trance with a few lines of poetry. Not just any lines. They were lines from The Ecstasy by John Donne, an English poet who lived at the beginning of the 17th century. Sat we two, one another's best. Our hands were firmly cemented with a fast bomb, which thence did spring. Our eye beams twisted and did thread our eyes upon a double string. We recited these lines together, but not aloud, 
Not exactly. In a low murmur. And when we finished those lines, we were locked into a mutual trance of memory. And we remembered how it was. It was evening. It was late, late in the evening. And the eight members of the Gnostic cell in the small temple in a sacred grove near Antioch were reaching the height of their trance. Now, consistent with the Telestic method, they had drunk a potion earlier, a kind of tea brewed from entheogenic plants. And then they waited for the trance to come on. But they did not wait empty-handed They were going to the light. They were going to the peak of the trance with a question. They always formulated a question before they drank the sacred brew. And then, when they reached the height of the trance, they recalled the question and they asked the question to the light. So there they were in the depths of night, with darkness all around them, in a small building of stone. You can't call it a temple. There was no ornamentation. And around the building was a wall, a protective wall, with an opening, with no gate. And there was a sacred acacia tree in the courtyard. The front door of their little building was open and the balmy night air poured into the room. It was lit with just a few candles. They sat in semi-darkness and entered the full trance, the cognitive ecstasy of Gnosis, together as one mind, even as one body, as a cell, a cell of mystery. And having prepared for the moment of beholding the organic light, they recalled the question that they were to ask in that ritual on that evening. And this was the question, or rather it was a command. Sometimes they would command the light. And on this occasion it was fitting to do so. The command was, show us that portion of the anthropic genome that encodes the talent of thymesis. I kid you not. That was the exact wording of their command. Now, as Gnostics, they had dedicated many of their ritual sessions and a great deal of their work outside of the mystery cell to investigating the properties of the human genome. And they knew, on the basis of their tradition, what was passed down to them by seers of other times, by the Magians who founded the mystery cells, as well as by their own ongoing research, they knew that the anthropic genome is coated with seven talents. And on this evening, they wanted to look deeply into the coding of one particular talent, thymesis. That is the talent of the human animal to dare and to defy. It includes not only daring to do physical acts and to undertake strenuous physical activities or to undertake great adventures like sailing across an unknown sea, but it also included daring to know, daring to learn, daring to investigate, and defying anything that stood in the way of the path to genuine first-hand knowledge. So this evening, they commanded the organic light to show them the properties of thymesis 
in intricate detail. When it came to the moment to pose their command syntax, as it's called, to the organic light, they were in full-blown ecstatic trance. They were immersed in the light. They could see the light that casts no shadow. They detected its special properties, its soft texture like a marshmallow, and then its coolness like a melon. An incomplete and confident immersion in the light, they prepared to give their command. But before they did it, one of the women in the group, there were four men and four women, moved aside from the circle and picked up a stone. It was a large round stone shaped like an egg, and it was white, perhaps marble, perhaps alabaster. And she took this stone and set it down in the midst of the circle. And they all looked at it with one unified gaze. And then the Telestis, who led the session that evening, who had been chosen by Lot at the beginning, pronounced the command. But he did not pronounce it aloud. He pronounced it with a mudra and a gesture of his hand. And at that moment, they all pronounced it together, but without speaking. And then they gazed at the round white stone. And that evening, as they did on many evenings before, they gazed for two hours with unbroken concentration. And during those two hours, this is what they saw in the stone. They saw a motion, at first like cloudiness, some kind of indistinct, cloudy, molting, and soft movement, a movement in perfect silence. And then they saw something like dimples, little points within the light, in the soft, cloudy, but radiant light. But were they dimples, or were they puckers? Did they protrude in or out? It was impossible to say, but gradually they formed into lines, into a chain, and the chain moved like a tentacle, and then it became two and three and several tentacles, winding and coiling and uncoiling. And then they saw that the strange points of compression on the tentacles took the appearance of something that cannot be described, but perhaps crudely compared to the appearance of the suction cups on the limbs of an octopus. And there was something like an octopus of light floating in the light inside the egg-shaped stone, floating as they were floating, and everything was floating in the organic light. They continued with unbroken and unfaltering concentration. And next they saw that what looked like the suction cups on the tentacles turned into anemones, soft anemones, opening and closing in a rhythmic way all along the tentacles as the tentacles writhed slowly, coiling and uncoiling, seemingly within the space of the white stone. And then they all leaned forward slightly and they saw that the anemones 
arranged along the tentacles became like apertures, like eyes, or like lenses, and they could see that they were seen by the apertures, and at the same time, the apertures were given to them to see, to see through, and they looked through those apertures into the deep structure of the light. And there they saw the writhing, spiraline tentacles of the genome. At this moment in their visionary trance, they knew that they were seeing what they had asked to see. And a deep surge of rapture went through them all at once. But they did not react. They did not cry out in excitement. They simply held their lips pursed as if they were murmuring through their lips. And by holding their lips that way, they stayed in the high, high surge of the trance. And now it really came on. It came on in full colors, soft, gleaming colors, like wet jewels beaded on the tentacles that writhed and coiled. And there they saw the details of the molecular structure of DNA. The DNA specific to the Anthropos. And that was at the end of the first hour. And for the next hour, they looked more closely and they saw the construction and the properties within the construction that revealed a distinct portion of the molecular chain, that which they had asked to see, the segment that encodes thymesis. And then they looked deeper, steady, silent, and in the rapture of their knowing, they saw every detail in the magnificent, gleaming, wet, beaded coils of human DNA. And likewise, Lily and I stayed steady and silent in our trance, and we remembered what they knew, and we knew that the memory lingers on even when the actors are gone. And it must be true because it rhymes. We came out of our trance casually. Some things have to be done casually to be done right, even though they may be deeply serious. And we breathed and looked around the room. And it was still quite light, even though, oddly, it seemed like the sun had set. It was Lily who broke the silence, nodding her head reflectively. And she said, it's really remarkable, isn't it, that that evidence exists? Shall we look at it? And I said, yes. Let's do. And without turning her head, she glanced with her eyes to the left in the direction of a bookcase against the wall. I took the cue and I got up. And I walked over there to that elegant bookcase made of hand-carved wood. I knew it well. I had often consulted it when visiting Lily. It was the bookcase that held her collection of books on Gnosticism and the mysteries. And I knew exactly what book to pick. I took it out of the shelf. And I returned to my seat and held it up. Ah, yes, Lily said. 
There it is, that notorious document, the Panarion of Epiphanius of Salamis. All Gnostic scholars know this book. In fact, it's published by the Nag Hammadi and Manichaean Studies Library. And they all know that it's a document attributed to Epiphanius, who himself was said to have infiltrated a Gnostic cult. Now, like all the heresy hunters and all the Christian fanatics who hated the Gnostics, most of what he wrote, he wrote to condemn them. And in doing so, he misrepresented what they said and believed and did most of the time. But in one instance, in one passage, he did not do so. He spoke accurately of their secret rituals. And that is a rare disclosure in all the works that survive from the mass of writings against the Gnostics, the dossier of the prosecution. Now let's see if I recall, Lily said, it would be against Ophites, right? And I said, I'll bet it would. And so I riffled through the book to chapter 37, which is entitled Against Ophites. In fact, all the chapters are titled in that way. And they refer to 37 different sects of Gnostics. Well, not exactly 37, because some of the diatribes were against other sects that weren't really Gnostics at all. But Epiphanius and the rest of the gang of usual suspects didn't really know enough about what the Gnostics really taught to be able to distinguish clearly who were the genuine Gnostics Ah, but the Ophites, they were genuine. They took their name from the serpent, Ophis, and they were serpent worshippers. They considered that Ophis was the guardian of a particular kind of wisdom that they could access by encountering the organic light. A special kind of wisdom concerning the mysteries of the serpent power. So I riffled the book, and sure enough, it's easy to find that passage. Passage 5.6 in chapter 37. Let's read it again, Lily said. I always love to hear what he says in this passage. And this is what Epiphanius says. And these people who possess the serpent's share of wisdom call Ophus a king from heaven. And so, they say, they glorify him for such knowledge and offer him bread. For they have a real snake and keep it in a basket of some sort. When it is time for their mysteries, they bring it out of the den, spread loaves around on a table, and call the snake to come. And when the den is opened, it comes out. And then the snake, which comes up of its own accord and by its villainy, already knowing their foolishness, crawls onto the table and coils up upon the loaves. And this they call a perfect sacrifice. Wow. I say, and Lily says, wow again. That has got to be one of my favorite stories ever, she said. But of course, he left some things out. I don't know how he could have missed these details. They're not lost, though. Oh, I know them by heart. I said, I'll bet you do. Let me tell you then, she said. In the morning before dawn, when they had come out of the trance, they had arranged for some boys to come on a donkey 
from Antioch. Now they would not enter the courtyard, even though there was no gate. But they stopped outside, and they whistled. And one of the Telestai went out to receive from them a sack of fresh, warm bread. And then the bread was taken, the loaves, and placed on the table where the divining stone had sat. The boys had been instructed to make sure that the bread was warm, and indeed it was. You could feel the heat almost if you put your hand close by, and there was a steam that came off the crust. And then one of the telestai made a sound. Epiphanius did not record this sound. It was the sound to call the snake, the dwarf python of Numidia, which was a favorite snake and sacred to the Ophites. And yes, the snake came from a jar where it stayed in the corner of the room and it slithered across the floor and up onto the table and it slid among the warm loaves of bread. Now it is known that the dwarf python, like many other snakes, has a set of heat receptors along its jaw, along its lower jaw. So when it was called with that signal, it went directly to the warmest place in the room. And as it slid into the heap of loaves, it ran its head along the bread. It ran its heat receptors along the bread, around and around, and through the spaces between the loaves. The python was excited by the heat of the bread, and it writhed and coiled among the loaves. The initiates were now fully out of the trance, but they were still in the afterglow of that rapture, and they looked at the snake writhing among the loaves, and as they did, they recalled what they had seen in the height of the trance. And so they watched, seeing it again in this other way. And as they watched, their eyes gleamed with an uncanny light, and down their cheeks streamed warm tears, tears of a gratitude beyond words. So grateful, I said, so grateful were they. And Lily said, yes, as we too are grateful. And as if by a signal, upon hearing those words, the serpent uncoiled and moved across her legs and nestled itself in the corner of the love sofa. Lily took the cue from the serpent. All right, then, she said, and she stood up and stepped toward me. Lily stands about, well, no, exactly, five feet, nine and a half inches tall, making her just an inch and a quarter shorter than me. And as she stood there, within touching distance, my eyes were at the level where they often like to be. So I breathed out slowly. I breathed out upon her body a benediction of breathing upon her nipples, and I saw them perk. I paused, breathless, for a few beats. And then I drew in the air, breathing really slowly and deeply through my nostrils, and I took in the full scent of her from head to toe. It was the aroma 
of a fawn in heat. Ripe, gamey, mouth-watering. To my chambers, then, Lily said with a playful lilt. I prepared champagne on ice and a bowl of almond milk mixed with coconut oil, warmed by a candle. I'll bet you did, I said. And with that, Nuff said, so I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come. <laughs>